Hey guys, so I'm doing another video and look at another reason I believe that we're in Satan's little season. This will be number nine in the top 10 list. And this will be part of the study that we've been doing on has the millennial kingdom of Christ already occurred already now in Satan's little season. So let's get to it. Number nine reason I believe that we are indeed in Satan's little season. Versions and perversions of the Bible. This is what we see today. Version after perversion of the Word of God. This is what is being read in churches throughout the world within Christianity today. And you can just see the new life, the ISV, the LSV, the God's Word CEV, NJV, you see the Message, New American Bible, the ASV, the Amplified, the Web, the World English Bible, the NLT, NIV, ESV, NASB. This is utter confusion and a complete mess with the Word of God. The majority of these Bibles teach error. And not only error, but false gospels. And there's no power in these watered-down minority text Bibles. This is not what was read during the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. This is what was not preached out of during the Millennial Kingdom. Why so many different Bibles? Well, it's because this is part of Satan's deception during the little season. The Word of God is under attack since Satan was loosed from the bottomless pit, I believe, in 1776. And over the next hundred years, during the beginning of Satan's little season, there were pieces being put in place to directly attack and change the Word of God. So who changed God's word during Satan's little season? It began with these two men, B.F. Westcott and F.J.A. Hort, who basically got on committees to rewrite what was going to be a change of the King James Bible, which was bad enough at that time, but they snuck in minority texts and completely changed the fundamentals of God's Word. Fitton John Anthony Hort here was an Irish born theologian and editor with Brooke Foss Westcott, and they put out a critical edition of the New Testament in the original Greek in 1881. This was the beginning of all the modern Bible perversions that you see today. And you can read here, in 1870, the Church of England passed a motion to revise the KJV. Fifty-four scholars were divided into two committees, one for the Old Testament and one for the New Testament. The original intention was to simply update the language of the KJV. This is where Satan's minions come into play. However, the New Testament committee had two members with an ulterior motive. Brooke F. Westcott and Fitton J. A. Hort had spent the previous two decades developing a Greek New Testament using Aleph and Beta as a basis. They influenced the committee into not only updating the language, but changing the underlying Greek text of the New Testament from the Textus Receptus, the majority text, to their own critical version, the minority text, coming from the Alexandrian text. These were corruptions of God's Word. And so in 1881, they released the New Testament in the original Greek, the text revised by Westcott and Hort. An English version was produced later, the revised version of the Holy Bible. 
This was done between 1881 and 1885. Westcott and Hort had occult connections. They were warlocks, they were wizards. Concerning the scriptures, Westcott and Hort stated, and this is a statement from Westcott, I reject the infallibility of holy scriptures overwhelmingly. And Hort stated, evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. So these two warlocks had no respect for the word of God. They did not believe that God's word was true, and they thought that they could change it on a whim to whatever they wanted. These are other beliefs of Westcott and Hort. They believe that Jesus is not God, that man is divine. There was no bodily resurrection of Jesus. They taught Gnosticism. They were part of a ghostly guild, which was a society that they developed to study the paranormal sciences. They, uh, they were part of seances. They believed in Darwinism, that heaven and hell were not literal, that scripture is not inspired. And because of these beliefs, they were proud enough to change during Satan's little season the word of God that had been pure for the entirety of the millennial kingdom. And you can see here just a family tree of perversion that began down here with the revised version of Westcott and Hort and everything subsequent to that is related to this critical text this revision that they put in the late 19th century into the world. This is part of Satan's plan to corrupt the world of God. This obviously causes confusion. And today, people look to guys like this to tell them which is the best Bible translation for me? Is it the ESV? Is it the King James? Is it the NIV? And we have these experts here that think they're experts. They're going to give that particular person the answer on what Bible version they should choose because literally there are hundreds of choices in this deceptive times that we live in. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And that's what God's word was preached during the millennial kingdom after the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the churches of the saints, there was no confusion. There was none of this. And I like this slide. It says, wake up. Satan's goal from the very first was to corrupt the word of God. On the side, it says, they have been perversions of God's words ever since Satan fell. But specifically after Satan came back from the bottomless pit, that is when we have seen hundreds and hundreds of perversions of God's word, especially in the last hundred plus years. I like this Unitarian Universalist um, message board in front of their church. Bible study, 7 p.m., bring Bible and scissors. <laughs> and that's what these Bibles are. They are the true word of God, chopped up, missing verses, changed passages. The meanings are completely different now, and there's no power. And that's why the churches that these Bibles are used in have no power. 
it says right here, it just shows right here, the NIV corrupted the word of God and the NIV has left out many Bible verses from the Texas Receptus, from the received text that was given, I think, at the time of the Millennial Kingdom of Christ in the English language. But I like this. Have you ever seen an NIK? There's not a new international Quran. The devil is happy with it just the way it is. But today, we have so many scholars and theologians deciding which is the best translation to use. And we have people arguing against the King James Bible and that there shouldn't be where we use King James only. It's become, during Satan's little season, the Word of God has become controversial. King James only controversy. But there's no Bible other than the Holy Bible. We see it today, majority of in the King James Bible. But there are other versions that are still available from the Testus Receptus that was given at the time of the Millennial Kingdom of Christ in the English language, like the Geneva Bible, that matches the King James Bible practically word for word. There are no missing verses. There are no changes in the passages. So there's the Holy Bible, and then there's the counterfeits, the NLT, the NIV, the message, which is a New Age perversion by Eugene Peterson. But we have to understand that the word of God is to be trusted and that it is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. There are no errors in the Holy Bible. There are absolutely none. And that's what Christians should believe and trust. The Word of God, the Holy Bible that we have today through the King James Bible. If you want to read the Geneva or something, that's fine too. I find it a lot more convenient these days to read the King James Bible. But it's basically the Holy Bible. And these Texts, a majority of texts, were given to mankind during the Millennial Kingdom of Christ as the English language began. And like I said, I think that the English language was an Anglisk language. I think it was the tongue of angels that was given and spoken after the second coming of Jesus Christ and that the angels, the heavenly angels descending afterwards and the resurrected saints being a part of this saints and angels, the Anglo-Saxons, if you will. Some people say the sons of Isaac, and I have no problem with that. We see the 144,000 that are sealed at the time of Jesus' second coming of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, the sons of Isaac, the sons of Jacob, Isaac's sons, the Saxons and the angels, Anglo-Saxons. I think during the early period of the millennial kingdom, after the destruction of Jerusalem and fall of Rome, and the stone that crushed the feet of iron and miry clay, Rome and Jerusalem together, that the millennial kingdom became a mountain throughout and the resurrected saints, the 144,000 and angels all began to further the kingdom of God throughout the world. These were glorified saints. These were glorified angels with Christ who had heaven open to them and could come to earth and to heaven to direct mankind. This was the light 
with the rest of the world around it outside of this kingdom being the outer darkness. And you can see here the translation history of the English Bible. And if you'll look up here, you see from 300 AD to 1500, over 1200 years, you know, the dark ages that were taught, the medieval times, there was nothing, no English language. There was nothing as far as Bibles being produced but the Latin Vulgate. But I believe that our chronology is wrong and that the Dark Ages, this thousand-year period between roughly 500 and 1500 AD, was the Millennial Kingdom. I think time was added to the chronology that it actually began after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the fall of Rome in 76 AD, that time was added by the Antichrist, changing times and laws, and that the roughly 476 to 500 AD that we know as the true fall of Rome, supposedly, by our history books, that that was truly the time that the Millennial Kingdom started. And I think that shortly after all of these English versions of the Bible were being spread, throughout the world as the English language went throughout the world, the English language. The King James Bible was part of it, but there was a lot of others. There was the Geneva's Bible, there was the Tyndale, there was the Matthews, there was the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible. All of these were received texts. I think it was received from angels and saints in the English language given to mankind during the millennial kingdom of Christ and that these texts were spread throughout the world as the English language furthered throughout the world. There was no thousand year dark ages where there was no word of God except the Latin Vulgate. This is a lie of the Catholic Church and Satan himself. copyrights you will see and i did a i wrote a book about a decade ago called in spirit and truth the seeker's path to jesus christ and i was new to this how to uh, write a book when i use verses how what version i should use um, i looked into it every version except the king james bible i had to have copyright permission to use it but the king james bible i just put it in there because there is no copyright loss and it says here king james bible the word of god is not bound it's the last uncopywritten bible but you can see god's word here that we have today in the King James Bible is grouped together with all of these modern perversions that have come out of Satan's little season. None of these, save one, was part of the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. And you will see they will have different versions for different people de um, depending on if you want a word-for-word -word translation, a formal equivalent, literal, form-based. You want thought-for-thought -thought or a dynamic equivalent. How about a paraphrase, paraphrase, or functional equivalent, or meaning base? And you can see the different perversions of the Bible, save one, throughout this uh, continuum here. But all these Bibles are copyrighted. And why is there a copyright on modern translations of the Bible? Because the word of God is bound in Satan's little season and it is been perverted, changed, and now companies have ownership of these Bibles and they can put Bibles in seminaries. They can offer incentives to churches to get their version of the Bible into the churches and behind the pulpit. 
It is all about the money. Follow the money. Where you'll follow where you follow the money, there you will see all these perversions coming out year after year. If you just go into a bookstore today, go to the new international version, they have a whole section just of different new international versions. Why is there not just one new international version? Because they want to make money. They want to pervert the word of God more and more during Satan's little season. And you have to have a 10% change in verbiage of a book in order for it to have a new copyright. So these Bibles are being changed and altered by percentage points, by percentage points over years and years and decades and decades until the word of God has been stamped upon and muddied so much we don't, can't even understand it and it's confusing. Again, the authorized King James Bible is the only Bible version that is not copyrighted. It is public domain. You can see here, Jesus said, Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The way is narrow to eternal life because there's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. But if you look at these perversions of the Bible and read Matthew 7, 13, and 14, here in the New King James Bible, you will see this verse altered. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So, is believing on Jesus Christ difficult? It's as easy as eating a piece of bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. This is easy as drinking a glass of water. He says, I am the living waters. But these new Bible versions confuse young Christians, especially. Christians who are seeking God and reading verses like this that makes it look like it's hard and it's difficult. That the way is hard and difficult. This is what the English uh, Standard Version says. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So these modern Bible perversions that have been promoted, written, and continually altered during Satan's little season said says that the way is hard and difficult. The way is not hard and difficult. It's just narrow. The way is narrow. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It's just narrow because there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father sent His Son, who died for our sins, resurrected on the third day, overcame death for us, and gives us eternal life through trust in Him. We're to believe our Heavenly Father and trust his word, his promise, which we see in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ. But you see again in these perversions, we're not saved after believing the good news of Jesus Christ, but we're being saved. The KJV is correct from the Textus Receptus, from the received text, received, I think, through holy men and saints, possibly glorified saints, and angelic beings 
states, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross, the good news of Jesus Christ. Those who don't believe is foolishness to them. But unto us which are saved, believers in Jesus Christ, it is the power of God. The gospel has power. The word of God, the Holy Bible, has power. These versions don't have power. And they corrupt the word of God. The New King, King James Version, the NIV, the ESV, and the NLT all says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. These new versions, these perversions, will add man's righteousness and mix it with Christ and make the cross of none effect. It will teach a works-based salvation. It will teach a Calvinist way, a repent of your sins, heresy, false gospel that saves no one. John 6, 47. In the King James Bible, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. In the NIV, NASB, ESV, CSB, NLT, Verily, very truly I tell you, the NIV says, The one who believes has eternal life. Believes what, NIV? Believes what? NASB, same thing. He who believes. Whoever believes. Anyone who believes, anyone who believes, believes what? On me. On me. That's what Jesus is relating. He is eternal life. And the way to the Father and to receive eternal life is through believing on him. These perversions lead the main part of eternal life, Jesus Christ, out of the picture. So do you think these Catholic seminary students are being taught out of the King James Bible? Do you think they are being taught, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation? No. These Reformed Presbyterian theological seminary students here, do you think they're being taught out of the majority text? Do you think they're being taught out of the pure word of God, the good news of Jesus Christ? Do you think if you polled these 5, 10, roughly 20 seminary students and asked them, what's the gospel? And... What are you trusting in for the forgiveness of sins and life eternal? How many of these 20 coming out of seminary school from a Reformed Presbyterian using minority text Bibles and being taught in error, how many of them you think will tell you the good news of Christ and how to receive it? Not many, if, if any at all. In our own degenerate times, almost all Bible colleges and seminaries are as they were in the days of Elijah, in the hands of the Lord's enemies, A.W. Pink. And this is so true of the seminaries and the churches during Satan's little season. Again, Satan's little season has reached throughout every institution of our generation and the past generations in political system, in the educational institutions, the economic institution, especially the religious institutions, which we've seen by a direct perversion of the Word of God. And now these perversions through the love of money are getting into more and more seminary schools, more and more churches today. And you have seminaries putting theologians like Tim Conway out, 
who will love to tell you the myth of the King James only. Because that's what he was taught. And John MacArthur teaching his five-point Calvinist false gospel to thousands of people every week out of the English Standard Version. They love, these Reformed Calvinists love to use the critical minority text of Westcott and Hort because it perverts the Word of God and allows them to manipulate the Bible to teaching false doctrine. And the mega churches. How many mega churches like this do you think are preaching the Holy Bible, the Word of God, the King James Bible to the masses? None. Absolutely zero. I can guarantee that. I would love to see one mega church pastor that only uses the King James Bible. It doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because we're in Satan's little season. This is Satan's little season in the churches these days. And it only gets worse. The slippery slope that began over 100 years ago with Westcott and Hort is getting worse and worse. We have paraphrased Bibles this new age nonsense, the message by Eugene Peterson, Eugene Peterson here that looks like um, W.A.J. Hort, um, you know, and he was into Gnosticism and new age. And I can't even read some of the message because it upsets me so much seeing the perversion the changing, altering of God's word. It is so bad. And that's why the message is a mess. But it doesn't stop there. Not only in Satan's Little Season do we get this Gnostic New Age nonsense here written by Eugene Peterson, the message, but now we see Bible versions like this. This is a great, great granddaughter of Westcott and Hort's critical text. Continued perversion of the Word of God. The Queen James Bible is now out in a Christian bookstore near you. And I guarantee you, you will see more and more pastors within churches in the United States and the world use the Queen James Bible. And the way that this world is going in Satan's little season, within a generation or so, there may be more churches that use the Queen James Bible, led by pastors like this, than the King James Bible. Pastors like this. This is what is coming into the churches throughout the world in Christianity in Satan's little season. So I'll close with this. When your KJ friend, KJV only friend tries to peer pressure you into switching to the KJV and it says, be a lot cooler if thou didst. Yeah, it would be a lot cooler if we weren't being bombarded by all these perversions that we see now. Descendants of the Westcott and Hort revised text of the Holy Bible. It would be a lot cooler if we all use the same Holy Bible throughout all Christianity and didn't have hundreds of different Bible versions and translations, these perversions that you see today. It'd be nice to sit down with other believers and all of us grab a Bible and it's the same as that one. Just like when we went to school and we went into a classroom and we opened up our textbook and everybody read out of the same textbook and learned from it. But that 
doesn't happen. And that is another reason I believe we're living in Satan's little season. And we'll do another video on this topic very soon. God bless.